Good morning. Good morning. I feel good? Yes. Do you feel good? Yes. Remember what we said earlier? Well, what I said earlier, and I'm trying to uh, encourage you to feel good. And why do we feel good? Jesus. What does the song say? Stay with the song. Every time I talk about Jesus, I feel good. I'm here to talk about Jesus. And you are too. The mere life that you live and everything that you say and do, Jesus should be told. I am happy again to be here and to share with you some thoughts <clears throat> that I see as very important. You know, um, on the first opening night, David said, we want to talk about truth. Right? Present truth. And I said to myself, what is truth? And the Bible tells me, Thy word is true. Jesus is true. So every time I speak about Jesus, I am speaking what? The truth. As long as it goes with the book. As long as it goes with the Bible. We are here to be blessed. And God says that He will bless us. And I take that very seriously because the Bible tells me That God cannot lie. I think it's in uh, Titus 1 and verse 2. And Numbers 23 and 19. There are more. But those two verses. When I came across them. I made sure to mark them. You know why? Because. <clears throat> excuse me. For many years. My Christianity felt like it was a lie. I was trying. I was trying hard. I guess like many people. And um, there are days you tried and you got good results. And then shortly after that you would fall into a situation. And you're doing things that probably only you and God know about. Probably. And your conscience, you can't hide from it. It tells you that you're failing miserably. Until I was introduced to the message of righteousness by faith. Praise God. That message has changed my life. Will you kneel with me, please? While we pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, it is indeed a privilege for us to assemble in this fashion every time. When we come, Father, to be taught by you, Father, you have promised that where we, where we are, you will be there too. And you're here to teach us. Teach us now, O oh God. Remove from us every thought that is impure. Forgive us where we have said or done anything. Cleanse our hearts and open our minds so that your spirit, which you promised that will be poured out, that we might be vessels ready to receive this blessing that you say, and I know that you will give. Speak through me, O oh God. Let the words that I speak be yours and not mine. And may the hearers, Father, may the ears that, it, that these words fall on, may they believe. May they believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. David spoke about yesterday. Um, shadows and reality. He spoke about type and anti-type. And today I just want to kind of continue on, on in that vein, if you will, and share with you some thoughts that I see as very relevant and as present truth, because what we're really talking about is simply the old covenant and the new. And it came to my attention a few months ago that many people are still, Christians are still living and worshiping in the old covenant and it was very startling to me that I was doing the same thing too until I started to study and truth started to come out and I was convinced that there needed to be a change so I want to share some of those thoughts with you today you could call it the physical versus the spiritual I was entitled that the physical versus the spiritual you know Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 9 and verse 16. He says, 
No one patches up an old coat with a piece of new cloth. Why? For the new patch will shrink and make even a bigger hole. Think about that. <coughs> Nor does anyone pour new wine into old wine skin. Why? For the skin will burst and the wine will pour out and the skin will be ruined. But instead, new wine is poured where? Into new wine skin or new bottles. And both will be kept in good condition. Now, I don't know how you understand that, that uh, verse. But, and there can be different applications or understanding. But at the end of my presentation, hopefully, the right and the true meaning will come to you. The old, which we refer to as the physical, versus the new, which is the spiritual. I know that we are behind time. I just um, want to say that we are, it's now 10, 15, 10, 17, and I'm supposed to be through in an hour. I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Okay. All right. What is your understanding of a covenant? People say it's an agreement. Okay, fine. Some say it's a contract on, on what they do. It's a promise and all of that. Fine. I would like to submit to you a very simple but important way or understanding or definition of a covenant is simply it's an agreement that brings about a relationship of commitment. Again, it's an agreement that brings about a relationship of commitment between God and his people, between you and God, between me and God. If you think of, think of it along that vein, I think things will be very simple. You know, Jesus said to some church folks a long time ago, he said to the Jews, he said, you search the scriptures, which by the way, another term for scriptures is what? Word of God. But when he said that, what was he referring to? Specifically, the Old Testament. The Old Testament or the Old Covenant. Or you can even say the law. And he says, you search them. For in them you think you have what? Eternal life. But they, referring to the scriptures or the law, or the old covenant, does what? Testify or give evidence of me. We usually stop there, but the next verse says, you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Wow. Here's our group of people who are searching the scriptures. They are searching for eternal life, but Jesus is saying, I am the light. And you're not willing to come to me. How sad. You know, he goes on and he says in different places, for example, in Matthew 11, 28 and 30, and I'll read this quickly. He says, come unto me all in that labor, and I have laden. I will give you rest. Learn of me and you shall find rest in your soul. John 6 and verse 37, he says, I will not cast you out. Him that cometh to me. John 14, 6 says, I am the way. Jesus is speaking. I am the truth and I am what? Life. Not life. The life. It's important that we get this one right. He's not referring to just the mere existence of living things. He's referring to the life of God. His life. That's what he's saying. And he says, if you come to me, I will give it to you. And he says, I am come that they might have life in another place. And he says, that they might have it what? More abundantly. And even the beloved John, in the book of John chapter 1 and verse 17, John says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. 
And we beheld this glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. The law was given by who? Moses. Moses. But technically, who gave the law? God gave the law. But we understand that, so we're not going to go into that today. But let us remind ourselves that the law, or the scriptures, because remember now, um, the New Testament was not written yet. So when we're talking about the law and the scriptures, we're talking about the Old Testament. Let's keep that in mind as we speak, right? The Old Testament, it meant everything to the Jews. You just have to read the Bible and you'll see. The religion which we know as what? Judaism. Judaism stood on, or you could say it was based on what we call the law. Upon what the law said. And as I said, that was very sacred to the Jews. They were proud of it. And they practiced it religiously. Just look at the life of Paul. Let me give you a good example. It was a system based on law. So we can call that, or it is called, a judicial system. As David said yesterday, it was not Christianity. It was then, and it is not today. God gave Moses, yes, who was the leader at the time, who gave it to them. And it was a system, yes, designed by God, but it was not meant to last forever. I'm speaking about the old covenant, the law. It was never designed to last forever. No, sir. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3 and verse 24 to 26, and I'm going to try and read most of this in your hearing in the interest of time. Um, it says, Wherefore, Paul is speaking, the law was our what? Schoolmaster or our tutor to bring us to who? Christ. So the new, sorry, the Old Testament, which we refer to as the tutor, and you notice the Jews always say, what does the law say? Whenever they were arguing and they were having a discussion, one of the first things they would turn to is, what does the law, law say? They say? The law says. But Paul says it was a tutor to bring us to Christ, so that we might be what? Justified by faith, we might be made righteous by faith. But law cannot do that. But he goes on to say, But after faith is come, you are no longer the schoolmaster. You are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.19 says it was added, giving you the reason because of what? Transgression. And in Hebrews 7 verse 19 says the law made nothing perfect. It was only a teacher. It was your tutor. It, served, it has its purpose and it still does today. But it made nothing perfect. In fact, the writer of Hebrew, he understood this. And in chapter 10, sorry, in chapter 7, where am I? I beg your pardon. In chapter 10 and verse 5 to 10, he quotes from Psalms. Did you know Psalms the part of the law? Yes. Psalms 40. When you read Hebrews 10, you'll see that. So he's quoting in Hebrews 10, but he's really quoting from um, Psalms 40. He says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. I jump down to verse 8. Above when he says, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin thou wouldest not. In other words, he did not desire, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by law. So the whole sacrificial system was based on what? Law. Very clear. And verse 1 says, For the law having a shadow, as pointed out, of good things to come, and not the very image of the thing, can never with those sacrifices which are offered, year by year continually, make the come up perfect. 
But he goes on and says, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. Which is the first? The old covenant. He says he takes it away so that he may establish the second. By which, referring to now, the second, you are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. As Jeremy said yesterday, for everyone and for all times. In Hebrews 9.13, the question is asked, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an ephra sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood, what's another name for blood? Life, Life of Christ, says the blood of Christ, substitute, how much more the life of Christ? Who through the eternal spirit, by the way, offer himself without spot, purge your what? Conscience from dead works. Now some people don't like to hear that or they say, what is dead works? Well, in the context of how this is written, there's only one understanding I can come up with. And he's referring to the things that were told in the law for the people, for the Jews to do. But I won't go into the, any details on the understanding of that. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So what really does God require? Because it says, He doesn't have any pleasure in sacrifices or in offerings. Is that the God that you serve? Is it a God who loves to see animals being killed? Does he love to see uh, animals being put on altars and burned? Is he pleased like that? Hosea 6 and verse 6 gives us a clue, gives us a, one of the responses or the answers. It says, For I desire what? Mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offering. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 tells us, I, I beseech you therefore, burden that what? By the mercies of God, underscore, by the mercies of God, keep that in mind, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reason of the service. That is what God requires. I know this is by God's mercy, it's not by your efforts. And it goes on to say, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by how? The renewing of your mind. Another word for mind is what? Your heart. But we know mind is the better word, right? We know that. That you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Now I'm kind of dwelling on this a little bit, you know, just I haven't gone deep into the end it yet. Because I think this is important that you kind of get that understanding of what God requires. And what was the purpose? And he says in Hebrews 8 verse 11 and, sorry, Hebrews 8, 12 and 13, and I'll read it, it says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more by the mercies of God. God is saying, I am the one who's going to do it for you. Again in Amos 5, I won't read that. Referring to uh, the Jews, he says, I despise your feast days, I will not smell in your assemblies. And these are stuff that God instituted. He said, take away from me the noise of your songs, and I will not hear the melody of your violence. But let what? Judgment run down as water, and righteousness as what? A mighty stream. You know what that word judgment means? Justice. justice. I want justice. <laughs> I know that would make you laugh. <laughs> right, Jeremy? Right, right, okay. But right. well, you know, I say that because the Bible says, who is the just one? Jesus. It says that. And it says, God alone is good. So in that context, I want justice. All right, I know you will agree with me, right? Yes. He has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Let us look a little bit now at some of the things of the Old Covenant. 
Turn with me to, he, to Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'm going to just stay in Deuteronomy. I had to cut this down a lot because Exodus is numbers. Yeah, they look like I'm always the one finding the first, but I believe some of you beat me quick this morning. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I'm going to read verse 1, verse 13, and probably verse 14. All right, follow me, please. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 1, 4, sorry, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now, therefore, heart no Israel unto the statutes. Who's speaking? Through Moses, right? So it's really Moses, right? He said, Now, therefore, heart no Israel unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that you may live. Notice the reason why. Do them so that you can what? Live. Remember, we're talking about the physical and spiritual. Keep that in the back of your mind. And go in and possess the land. Notice, is that a spiritual or a physical thing? Physical. You say you might live. It didn't say give you eternal life. It say that you will live and it says that you will possess the land. Right? Remember, the children of Israel were journeying from Egypt to the promised land. So when it says the land, we know what it's referring to. Which the Lord your God and Father giveth thee, or giveth you. Verse 13. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even the what? Ten commandments. So when we're referring to the covenant, what's included in there? The ten commandments. So that's a part of it. Right? Which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it. All right. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Read from chapter 2. I want this to flow. So I'm just going to read, 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 read. Right? Deuteronomy chapter 5. Chapter... Uh, Verse 2 and 3, 6 to 22. But I'm not going to read all of that. But you'll get the gist of, of what it is saying. And it says, The Lord your God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Where is that? All right. The Lord made not his covenant with your fathers, but with us, even us who are all of us here alive this day. Go to verse 6. Our verse 5 says, I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid by reason of the fire and, uh, and went not up unto the mountain, saying, Look at verse 6. I will read it from verse 6 to 14. Glance at it quickly and tell me what that is. The Ten Commandments. I will read it. Verse 6 down to about verse 14, somewhere around there. Of Deuteronomy chapter 5. If you glance through it quickly in the interest of time, you'll see that it's referring to the Ten Commandments. So, right, it's in there. Now go to verse 27 of the same chapter, and it says, Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord your God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and what? Do it. What Moses is doing is reminding them, he's kind of reviewing, reminding them all that took place. And says, you said, I was to go, and I went, and you said, when I, you said, you know what, we're afraid. You go, Moses, and whatever the Lord tells you, and you tell us, we will do it. Verse 28, and the Lord heard the voice of your words, Moses is reminding them, when he spake unto me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the word of his people, which they have spoken unto thee, they have well said, un underscore well said all that they have spoken. Pay attention to verse 29. God is speaking now. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep how many? All my commandments, hold on, always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. They meant well. God says, I wish there was a heart in them like that. 
they were not joking. They were serious. They thought that, they, they, I mean, they understood fearful, yes. The Bible says Moses was afraid. But they says, yes, Lord, we will do it. But God knows the heart. Does he not? I know something, we're not much different, you know. We mean well. But God says, oh, I wish you had a heart like that. Hmm. I wish you had a heart like that. Look at verse 32 and 33. You shall observe to do, uh, therefore, as the Lord your God hath commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. Notice it says here, you shall walk in all the ways. Where in the Bible does it say, even one time, that the children of Israel walk in all the ways? Or in fact, is there anyone that does that? Do you know of anyone who does that? Because I don't know. There's only one being, and that is Jesus. But that's what it says. The, 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 the promise is based upon what they did. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 3, Hear therefore Israel and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase how? Mightily. Is that a physical or a spiritual? Physical. It goes on to say that the Lord your God of thy father hath promised thee the land that floweth with what? Milk and honey. All physical blessings. Let's jump down to verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that it might be what? That he might preserve us alive, physical again, as it is at this day. And it shall be your righteousness if don't miss that little word. It is your righteousness if we observe to do how many? All these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. I think you get the point I'm making. It was conditional. If you are able to do that, then you can claim all these promises. But it was all physical. But you know he says, it shall be your righteousness. What is man's righteousness? What? No, I didn't say. What? What does Paul say? Man, righteousness is. Is that filter as okay? He says it's the law. He says it's the law. The Bible says there is none that is righteous. No, not one. In Romans chapter three. In Psalms 53 it says, every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that do it good. No, not one. In Ecclesiastes 7 20 it says, For there is not a just one upon the upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Isaiah 64 says that all we are all as unclean things, and our righteousness are as filthy rags, our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And Paul in Philippians 3 and verse 9, and that's the verse I wanted to get to, says, And be found in him, not having what? My own righteousness, which is what? Of the law. That is man's righteousness. But it goes on. And it says, but. In other words, that but makes a difference. That's man's righteousness. But it says, the righteousness that he wants, it says, the rest of the verse says, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. So, the righteousness here that we see in, Genesis, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, that was man's righteousness. That was the conditions given to the Jews, the children of Israel at that time. Unfortunately, they meant well, but they were not able to do it because it was only based by law. And none of us can keep the law perfectly. If you look at Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9, it says, Know therefore the Lord your God, He is God. 
The faithful God which keepeth the covenant with mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments a thousand generations. And repay them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slacked to him that hated him. He will repay him to his face. Now that's kind of serious. Here's a God that, gave, that gives you some directions and he says, you have to keep all of them. And if you don't keep them, I will repay you to your face. Is it not something you can't get around? It stands out very clear. It, it, it says in verse 12, Therefore, same Deuteronomy 7, It shall come to pass, if, if you hearken to these judgments and keep, and do them that the Lord your God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers. And he goes on and says, he will, uh, he will love thee and bless thee in verse 13 and multiply thee and so on and so forth. Notice the condition again. God is saying, if you do these things, then you will receive the blessing. And in Deuteronomy 8, of course, I won't read that. It gives a reason for the commandments. And in Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, we can look at that one. Just those three verses. It says, And all the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do them. Notice again, all that you may live physical and multiply physical again. That means in numbers, physical multiplication. That means um, the, uh, the increase, the descendants. And go in and possess the land, physical again, which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee forty years in the wilderness. To humble thee, notice he's giving the reason. To humble thee and to prove thee, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but how? Every word I proceed at the mouth of God. The reason for all of this, Moses is saying, that what God wanted to show the children of Israel is that you meant well, you think you have a heart that you can serve God, and you want to do it, but you can't. You can't of yourself. And he tries to bring out this picture more and more. And this chapter and verse, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 4, it's the same verse that Jesus quote in Matthew 4 and verse 4. When did he say that? He was speaking to the devil. Remember this temptation? He says what? Man shall not live by alone. This is where he was quoting from. Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14 and 15 to 20 describes the blessings of the obedience and so forth. And some of them are very, very, very hard. I think Ken read some of them yesterday. Deuteronomy 28, I believe. I believe that's the one. Let me see if it's it. And she shall come to pass, read it from verse 1, if thou wilt shall hearken unto, diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all the commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations. And in verse 9 it says, The Lord shall establish thee, the holy people, unto himself, as he hath sworn to thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments. And he goes on again. But go to verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28, and notice what it says here. The rest of this chapter, which we won't read, but you'll get the gist from 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments, no strict this is. He says, if you don't hearken to do all of them and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. He says, curse shall be thou in the city, curse shall thou be in the field, curse shall thou be in the basket, and shall be thy basket and thy store. Curse shall be the fruit of the body and the fruit of the land. The increase of, uh, of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in. Cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. 
goest out, the Lord shall send upon thee cursing and vexation and rebuke in all that thou, sitte, that thou settest thine hand unto for to do. Just jump down to 21. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from the land whether thou goest to possess it. Verse 22, the Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with extreme burning and with sore. Verse 23, and thy heaven that is over uh, thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. Verse 24, the Lord shall make Mercy, the rain of thy land powder and dust. Mm -hmm. 25, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemy. Verse 26, thy carcass shall be meat under the fowls of the ear. The Lord, 27, will smite thee with the touch of Egypt. Does that sound good to you? That's the old covenant. That would scare anybody. And they still never kept it. You can't spiritualize this away. No. no, it's not. That is the old covenant, our part of it. Hmm. Obedience to the statutes and judgments and the commandments in the old covenant meant good. Disobedience means what? Harsh punishment. Severe penalties. This is the way of the physical. This is the way of law. You can relate to that. You break the law, the judicial law today, there are penalties. Am I right? Yes. Harsh and severe. Just look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Quickly. I'll just give you a quick verse. Verse 18 down. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. Here are some of the penalties. Now remember now, the law was given by who? By God. It's the same God that you worship today. Under the old covenant, it says, if a man, if a man have a what? Stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father. Is that common today? All right. Or the voice of his mother, and that when they have ch chastened or chastised him, will not hearken unto him, then shall his father and his mother lay hold of him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gates of his place. Verse 20, 20 and they shall say unto the elders of the city, This is our son. This, our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a what? Glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the, his city shall do what? Stone him with stones that he should die. Man, don't you think that's severe? Many of us would not be alive today. Stubborn and rebellious. Here's another one. Deuteronomy 22. Look at another one. Deuteronomy 22. 22, verse 22. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shall thou put away evil from Israel. But let me ask you. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then he shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and he shall stone them with stones that they die. The dams because she cried not, neither, and so on and so forth. Talking about adultery and fornication. Think about if that was applicable today. In the church. All right, I know I'm kind of taking long. Uh, Deuteronomy, I think you get the point. One more. <laughs> Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Verse 15 and down. Don't worry about it. Oh, well, we read that already. Let's look at, um, you have Numbers 11 too. Let's look at the last one. Ezekiel 20. Can you find that? Ezekiel 20, verse 13, I think.
Verse 13. Or let's read 12. More also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord thy God has sanctified them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgment, which of a man do, he shall even live in them. If we go down to verse 24. Because they had not excused my judgment, but had despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols. Therefore I gave them also statutes that were not good, and judgment whereby they should not live. Have you ever read that verse? God says, I gave them judgment that was not good, and I gave them statues. Sorry, I gave them statues that were not good, and judgment whereby they should not live. I never said that. That is the old covenant. But you know that Apostle Paul talks about the old covenant and the new covenant in Galatians 4. And he says, he makes a, an interesting analogy in Galatians 4, verse 20. 1, 20, 21 to 31, he talks about it. And he says, The one from Mount Sinai, which one is that? The old covenant gendereth to what? Bondage. It gives birth to bondage. That is the old covenant. Brothers and sisters, the scripture says in that same Galatians 4, we are not children of the bondswoman, but of the what? Free. And he says that we are to what? Cast out the what? The bondwoman and her son. He's referring to what? The old covenant. And in Hebrews 8, it, it, it reads, 78, it says, For if that the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, children of Israel, but he says the covenant wasn't faultless either. Remember? He said, Behold, the days come to the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. And in Hebrews 9 and verse 1, he tells us then that, that the first covenant had also ordinances and divine services and worldly or earthly, it had an earthly sanctuary. All of that is underneath the old covenant. The system of the old covenant was not an eternal one. It was something that is temporal. And even the Ten Commandments had to do with this world. Here, nothing in the Old Covenant had to do with eternal life. Is that correct? It is true. Nothing, when I say nothing, I mean nothing. It had nothing to do with eternal life. Everything had to do with this world that I said. And in Hebrews uh, uh, chapter 9, and verse 9 and 10 refers to that. In reference to the first tabernacle, it says, it was a figure. We won't go into that much because David expounded and made it so clear and, and, um, and, uh, and, and simple for us to understand. But it says it was a figure that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washing and card and ordinances imposed on them until the time of what? Reformation. Is the time of reformation still down in the future? I don't think so. I don't think so. Friends, let me put it to you this way. We cannot be Christians of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant at the same time. You can't. You confuse. I mean, I could stay here all morning. I, just, I took some time just to give you a gist of what some of the things were on in the Old Covenant. And we're going to touch the new one in a minute. But you can't. And if that is what we are doing, the Bible says Christ is become of what? No effect to you. And you are falling from what? Grace. For, for by grace you are what? See, you don't want to be falling from that. If we are trying to do this, we have not fully understood the gospel. I don't think so. The old covenant nowhere provides eternal life. What do you want? The theme of our 
can't mean this what? A time to choose. Which covenant are you choosing to serve the living God under? Look, when you don't know is one thing, but when you know, you've got to pull up your socks. You've got to start to deal with it now as you understand the truth as in the gospel and in Christ. It does not provide salvation. The Bible says the law, same old covenant, is not a faith. Think about that. It is not a faith. So you can't compare apples with oranges. The old covenant is not a faith. But the new covenant is a faith. Don't tell me that they are the same. Well, I ask a lot of Adventists, you know, and they say it's the same thing. I mean, I'm not scared to say it because they, they, say, they say, well, you know, let's take it from off the, 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 uh, the tablets and it's now in your heart. I don't think they have a clue as to what that means. For grace, for by grace we are sin. We are not under law. So the Bible says we are not under law, but what? But we are under grace. You know what that word grace means? When you have time next time, look it up. Many of us are still in bondage. We're still under law and we don't realize it. Let's quickly, let's take a quick look at the spiritual side. The spiritual covenant, the spiritual agreement, the spiritual relationship, as we said, which is called the new one. My Bible says that this covenant, the new one, it is a spiritual one. It is not of works. Ezekiel 36 explains it, and also Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8. Here's what it says. I read in your here quickly. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I like to, I'm going to read it from Ezekiel 36. I don't remember what verse it is. I just copied that part. But it says, For I will take, notice, for who? I. I. Who is I? That's right. God is speaking, referring to the new covenant. He says, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of, of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall what? Be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That is total cleansing. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you, praise God, and cause you to walk in what? My statues. And you shall keep my judgment and do them. Isn't that the opposite of what we just read? They meant well. They wanted to do it. They tried to do it. And we... Are some of us still trying? Some used to and got it and they get it and they're not trying to do that anymore. But no, God is saying, don't you see? You can't do it. I wish you had a heart. But he says, I am going to do, do it for you. Praise God. Hebrews, brethren, are you aware this is righteousness by faith message? Yes. Some of you might not, but I don't have the time to explain it today. But just think about that this is. This is the new covenant. Which one would you choose? Think about it. Hebrews 8 says, I think it's verse 7 and 8. If that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For find and fault with them, he said, Behold, the day is come to the Lord. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Friends, as I understand, the old covenant system was not meant to be permanent as a faultless system. It could not and can never produce righteousness. Galatians 3.19 says, Wherefore then serve the law? It was added because of transgression. And in Galatians 3.24 it says, It was our schoolmaster. We already did that. But after faith is come, 
you are no longer under the schoolmaster. I think that's verse 25. Galatians 3, verse 21. If there had been a law given which could have given life, really righteousness should have been by the law. Law cannot give life. Remember? Remember what Jesus says. I am come to give you life. I am the one. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are what? Not under the law, but under grace. You know, I looked up the word grace in the uh, concordance. It is number 5485. Grace. Strong concordance. 5485. Eight, five. It means graciousness, especially the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. That is what the grace is. It is Christ. It is His Holy Spirit. When Jesus says, I will come to you, that is the grace. That is what we are referring to. The Holy Spirit. And even in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, I looked up the word grace again. It says, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. It's the same word with the same meaning. A divine influence, which is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Galatians 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, under the law to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth what? The Spirit of His Son. Where? Into our hearts. That is the new covenant, brothers and sisters. It is not just a theoretical thing. It is real. Jesus says, I am come that I may give you what? The life. That is it. What is life? It's the Spirit of God. Jesus came and introduced to the Jews a new and a better understanding of the Scriptures. One of the things he says, my doctrine is not of mine. Reading from John 17, verse 16. He says, My doctrine is not of mine, but him or his that sent me. Did not Moses, verse 19, that's John 7, 19, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keeps the law? So why are we trying to keep it then? Is our salvation based on that? Is that why? Or is it because we are brought up and we are bred in thinking that if you do something, you will be rewarded. If, 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 you, if you brush your teeth, I'll give you a treat. If you do well in your exam, I'll buy your bribes. And that concept passes on. And we are brought up in the church and it's the same thing that we were told. If you keep the commandments, and they, they find scriptures misquoted, yes. And they try to use it, and it says, yes. Jesus says, if you keep the commandments, then. But none of us can keep it. I can boldly say that. Some people like, you know, by my motive, I can challenge anybody. You can't keep the commandment. Try as you will. You will never keep the commandment. You will never keep the commandment. I used to think at one time that, well, I can do all things. So I'm gonna, Jesus is going to come and hold my hand. And together we're going to keep the commandment together. Is not me keeping it. It is Christ in me. He's the one who keeps the commandment. When I die, Jesus lives. That's what I understand. It's simply put. 33 and a half years. Jesus demonstrates what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. That's what it says. And he walked not after the fish, but after the Spirit. And he offers that same life, the life, the new life in Christ. He offers that in Romans 8 1. Paul says, the Apostle Paul, who understood this, and he says, There is what? Therefore, Romans 8, verse 1 and 2 done. There's what? You know it. No what? Condemnation to them which are what? In Christ who walk what? Not after the flesh, but after what? The Spirit. For the law 
of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Which one do you want to worship God under? So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. It says it so many times, my friend. This is what it means to experience the new covenant. Walking in the spirit. After rain. After, after, after. I run out of time. I run out of time. We start to live. This is the new covenant. So when Jesus says in John 4 and verse 23, when he says, The true worshiper shall worship the Father in what? Spirit and truth. Now you know what he's talking about. For the Father seeks such to worship, worship him. You know, when Paul wrote to the saints in, in Ephesians, and this is from Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. He says, Be what? Renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you what? Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That is the new covenant. What was he talking about? He was talking about walking and living in the spirit by faith, which is the very life of God. He's talking about the new covenant, which is essentially what? Righteousness by faith. In Romans chapter 8, he says, he talks about the law of the spirit of life. That is the law. That is the law that we need. That is the law that you're going to keep. Because God says, I will put it inside of you. I will do it for you. Praise God. I will clean you up. I will make you righteous. You can't make yourself righteous. I'm going to do it for you. Believe me and receive. Thank you for listening. Praise God. Amen.